Okay, I'll quickly introduce our today's speaker is Reimo Renholm from Palmu Inc. And, and Reimo was actually, gave one lecture in the service design methods course last spring. And I think it was perhaps the best lecture there. And it was really great that you came here and, and talked to us again. And Palmu is a service design company. It's perhaps, would you guys say you're the oldest or longest in Finland? And I have this kind of feeling that you guys invented the word palvelu muotoilu, so that, that gives you a lot of respect to you guys. <laughs> but without further ado, please Reima, let's start. All right. All right. Good morning everyone and uh, happy to be here today. Uh, how many of you failed during this week or made a mistake? Oh, all right, great. Was it fun? Probably not. Yeah. How about today? Any of you feel like failing already today? It's early morning, but today, yeah, today sounds good. Yeah, but yeah, failing isn't really fun. But uh, how many of you who failed during this week did you learn something from it? I guess yeah. That's. I think that's the point of failing. But that's the thing I'm I'm going to talk today about. But uh. First of all, uh, I, I would like to let's give a big hand to the organizers of the service design breakfast. This is the last one, but I hope that tradition will go on and develop further. So, all right. Uh, so I'm Reima. I, I come from Palmu. Uh, Palmu is now a four years old service design agency. Uh, we are uh, at the moment, I guess, 40 service design professionals. We do pretty much. Uh, anything con connected to developing new services and new service business from designing the customer experience in services to service production reorganizing it and uh, creating service vision and strategy also uh, well it's an interesting bunch of people from totally different backgrounds uh, from teaching to psychology to diplomacy so on and actually I guess four or five ex CEOs which gives an you know it's, it's a nice platform to start projects from the top when you are really able to make a lot more changes in the end. Uh, this is some of the stuff that is on my table right now. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is today is really not so much about digital stuff. It's more about really human-centric services. And I guess in a way I'm sort of an old school guy that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a slow adapter in new stuff, so I like to work with people and, you know, basic stuff. But um, at the moment uh, we are uh, reinventing the cleaning services with ISS, uh, then touching something that is really sacred, like Ruotsin Ristelut, which is a service that has been, as it is, like probably almost 30 years. So I'm, I'm not sure whether we can actually, whether we dare to redesign it, or should we call the, call the UNESCO and say that you should add this to World Heritage List or something like that. <laughs> and then really nice, uh, in, uh, really interesting and challenging project with the University of Helsinki. How to organize their inner services that are, uh, that they provide to researchers, how to organize them in a user-centric way. Uh, as you can probably imagine, there's a lot to do. And uh, recently I worked quite a lot with retail, with different kinds of uh, companies, you know, uh, basically trying to change the customer purchase behavior and how we do our shopping in different contexts in our everyday life. And a couple of really interesting new new business and new service development projects with Fatsar. And also uh, since a couple of months Palmo has an office in Copenhagen. So that's something that is also on my table exporting the Finnish knowledge in service design and service business to to the rest of the world and uh, this is basically my uh, main argument for today it's actually a ripoff from a uh, quote from Steve Blank who said that no uh, business plan survives its first contact with the customer so I'm pretty sure it it's also true with his service concept so so in a way like to fail or to mis make mistakes, it's uh, especially with services. It's sort of inevitable, and the key is like how to do it successfully. Then, 
But um, let us start from the airport. I will show a short clip here. Yeah. We have 15 million guests arriving, transferring and departing. And if we think about, for example, the process while you arrive to the airport area, to the moment of boarding, only during this process there has been 11 companies serving you. And if you think about Helsinki Airport, we have more than 1,000 companies serving you. There is one touch point which certainly you have uh, feelings about it and actually you talk about it but probably you don't have quite a high expectations towards it and that touch point is security check. Well the big question is how to involve people in a process that is generally felt cold and unwanted. And we can make it happen only by addressing all sectors of service. People, places and processes. Processes, when designing services, you have to try and make an error. You have to try again, ask, make an error and try again. We want to tell people what's going to happen, how they can help us to make the travel safe. You have to make sure that everyone the passenger and the customer service people know what is the aim. We also introduce service coaches. These people are inside the whole system, working all the time with everybody else. We want them to highlight the good things. The places are like a tip of an iceberg. That's the only thing you can see. But behind that, under the waterline, there are processes and people who are making it solid. Okay, we have the visible part now up. We want people to go through the security lane and tell us how they feel. We find that better awareness is better security. Airports are packed with functions, people, emotions. Why we chose the service design methodology as the approach to our project is that service design puts all these together. For our way, it actually means that it aims for smooth traveling. All right, so uh, I guess that's a really good example of uh, certain elements, you know, like the materials for designing a service. It tells a lot about the complexity of things when you are actually trying to design for something called a better experience for a customer. And uh, the basic design challenge here is that, you know, how to make the, uh, the most painful part in the airport experience a pleasant experience and actually make it feel to the customer like this is a service, this is not something that I just have to use. All right, but, you know, like Johanna said on the on the clip that 15 million users, 15 million customers in a year, 15 million different service experiences, and all the interactions are different. And uh, you know, uh, so it really makes you think that what actually are the materials for design when you are designing for a service? Uh, all the stuff that you we're able to see in this clip. It's mostly places, it's environments, it's interiors. But like you have said here in the clip, like those are only the tip of the iceberg. What really makes the service is what's underneath, is the processes, is the people. And with services, so it's always also the customer. So customers are always part of what is happening. You know, the places are there, they are there without customers, but the service never is there before the people and the customers come there. So, um, and what's also really interesting about this case is, you know, there's a really strong business case here also involved. Each uh, minute spent in a queue in the security lane is about 70, 80 cents 
less money spent on the airport. So when we started, they told us like, whatever you do, whatever you do to make it more pleasant to customer, don't fuck up with time because we're going to lose lots of money, 50 million uh, passengers a year. So you can count from that. But you know, uh, back to the materials. Uh, when you are trying to design something that is intangible, uh, people, processes, time, stuff like that, you you really like you, you have to do lots of modeling. You have to do lots of uh, thinking with your hands, visualizing to make the intangible concrete, make it somehow tangible that we know that we are talking about the same ideas and the same stuff that we want to try out. And like you have said, you have to make you have to trial uh, and make an error, and you have to do it many times. Actually, see how things work, and. Uh, you know, uh, lots of this stuff that this visualizing and everything you see here, it's, it's, they are sort of like tools, tools how we try to affect the materials like processes and people, and almost always it's about behavior. And uh, about trying stuff out, this is actually a picture from an airport service jam that we organized. It's like we did in one day event where uh, people who are regularly working in airports, they were with us generating ideas and exposing those ideas to customers in the airport. And what I've learned in many processes, this is the place where the design actually starts. So uh, before that, it's just like sitting on the table with the ideas and discussing and talking. But then when you expose it to a customer, then you s suddenly your process starts and you start realizing stuff about like, what is the actual context? What is what is this behavior that we want to change? And you, uh, like about the materials, there's uh, many elements that we find out that, well, maybe this stuff will work in order to change the processes as much as they can be changed, or in order to change service actions as much as they can be changed. But you know, really the way of finding out whether it will actually work or not is by trying. And one really, you know, good example about like what is the uh, what what the service design can be in everyday life. In a case like this, is like for example here because the service uh, the, the security check service is actually purchased from different companies who provide the service. So actually, the service level agreement is one of the tools of making the changes in the service. So in a way, the lawyer is a key the key service designer here making the agreement uh, work in a way that it supports continuous development and measuring and setting certain, certain targets uh, so airport can actually direct the service experience to the d direction where they want to go. And we did a pilot in Terminal 1 which uh, actually had pretty good results in terms of like raising the willingness to recommend. but. Uh, the piloting, the most important part of it was like really learning what stuff actually, what of those, what of those tools that we designed and, you know, service coaches that you have mentioned, what are the key elements that actually can make the desired change happen? So uh, if this gives sort of an example about the complexity when you are designing a serv for a service, so I think this really summarizes the point here. It's one of my favorite quotes. And, uh, you know, really the first, uh, you, the worst thing to do is uh, with designing services to spend time and money and effort to solving totally wrong problems. And because there's so many things that you can design, so many things that you can design to, uh, to can try to change, it's a really big risk. And actually, companies are doing it a lot. They're spending, there's numerous projects of solving totally wrong problems in the end. And, and even more, more stupid thing to do is to do it over and over again and expect different results. But that's the thing that they're also doing a lot. And what's really nice about this code is also that when you actually find the real problem, all, almost always the solution is already there. It's contained in a problem. You don't really need to do after that like, you know, much of ideation anymore. When you see that, okay, this is the thing, this is the biggest problem, you almost always see the solution right away. 
That's at least how I feel about it. And, uh, you know, of course, finding the right problem, it's, it's not like you're doing research only to find it. You're actually doing, learning by doing, making the errors to find the right problem. But it's not about, like, coming up with 100 ideas or changing 100 things. It's about, quite often, like, finding just one thing or one big problem that you should address to. Uh, I draw this picture to sort of summarize some of the complexities in, in designing for a service and, and also like to talk a little about uh, the importance of thinking it holistically because people are always part of it and at least for me designing services is really about like thinking about what do people want to achieve in their everyday lives what are their needs and goals and then thinking about like how can we address those goals how can we help them with what they want to achieve with the services that we offer and it's nowadays more and more when 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 it's more and more about intangible and you know concepts not about like individual touch points or uh, or what you can call them like service avatars or channels or, or call them whatever you want but quite a lot of design is done here in this level of individual touch points and, and it's the design that is about you know thinking about how should things be or what should it be instead of really asking the why question so why are we actually doing this why are we generating something new or changing something does it really address to these goals and needs people have and a friend of mine uh, professor Jette Newman one thing that I learned from him really important learning in my career is that you know in the end people don't really want to use services we just want to live happy and meaningful lives at least like I'm a really lazy person I necessarily I don't want to use any service I just want to be happy I want to do stuff that is meaningful for me and if I feel like some service helps me with that it's totally great but most of the services that I use is I don't really want to use them I just have to use them and that's a big thing that companies don't really get because they only think like this what and how questions instead of thinking about why and like when you start from why question then of course you need you need to do design in the touch points in the in the avatars or in the channels you have to organize those touch points into a nice customer journey that is a you know nice nice uh, solid experience for the customer you also need to do that but you should start from the why and I think this is really I would say that right problems are actually much more important than the right solutions and it changes a lot like at least the way that I was uh, like you know trained to be a designer back in the days it, nobody told me this it was more about like come up with ideas and make your ideas look good and uh, with services, it's huge risk that you spend lots of lots of time, and somebody sells his money usually solving totally wrong problems. And uh, many of the companies they really struggle with like how can we be more customer centric? And it's actually quite simple. You just need to ask why, instead of asking like what and how should we do stuff. So. This has been my advice for a couple of years to everybody that don't buy or sell service design. Only buy and sell solving the right problems. At least if you want to really ha help the organizations to, to develop and, you know, tackle the big issues that they're facing nowadays. There's lots of problems and the world is changing fast. And uh, we really need radical innovations. If you ask only how, it's like incremental development it's not radical and actually the funny thing is that organizations can't really they can't really do radical innovation because they are too experts they are too professional they know too much about like different possibilities of why things wouldn't work so I think actually you know professionalism is really dangerous whether it's a professionalism in you know you're a government officer or a 
engineer or even a service designer, it's really dangerous to say that I'm professional in this and I know how these things work and listen to me. You know, uh, instead of that, we need generalists. And I think this is one of the terms of who of you who were here to listen, Anton, speaking a couple of weeks ago. He was talking a lot about this. So uh, we shouldn't be experts. We should be more generalists. You know, think holistically. Because uh, if you look from the inside of an organization, you can't really come up with ideas about different possible future scenarios, at least not so many, as if you come from outside. And, you know, there's always, in organizations, there's those devil's advocates who say that, yeah, uh, like, they just come to meetings and uh, to tell you why things wouldn't work. And this is very Finnish way of thinking that, you know, trial is like first step towards failing. But it's also first step towards learning. And, you know, but those of you who work with big organizations, you know that there's always those guys who say that I can tell you a hundred reasons why this won't work. And that's when you kill the idea too fast before even trying it out. And this is familiar picture, like this is how organizations work. They have these professionals who are working in their silos and uh, you know, uh, most of the innovation most of the service development, most of the service production is done in these silos. And those people who sit in these silos, they don't necessarily even speak the same language. At least they don't speak the same language about the customer. And that's why most of the services fail big time. Like, you, you know, imagine if, if movies were made this way. They wouldn't be very good movies. But in a way, each customer experience, this customer journey is sort of a movie, it's a story. And no wonder there's not that many good stories, because the way how it's designed is from this platform. So this is not really good platform for innovation, because people who sit in these silos, they look at the customer through their existing offering. It doesn't lead to anything radical. They, it leads only incre incremental small developments. But we are in a situation that where we really need radical innovation. And uh, uh, I would say that, like, in a way, there is a situation like, like all this talk about involving customers and working with customers. There is a contradiction that many of the experts feel that this, this is now threatening me, like my professional identity is questioned here. And I like I, I can I can get the feeling I, I almost feel the same way sometimes like I'm a designer I like my, whether I'm good or not it's it's based on how good my design is but if I say that yeah well I can't design any good stuff I only fail and I involve the customers to really help me with the design and in a way I'm actually saying that I'm not a very good designer. And that's like, at least if you, if you think about people who are, have certain position in organization and they think that they are measured in the organization based on how professional they are in what they are doing, I, I can totally see why they feel threatened about this kind of thinking that, okay, yeah, there's this rise of generalists and yeah, we also should be now customer-centric and, and uh, work with customers a lot. So it's also an identity cast of question. It's like a question of, will they need me anymore in the future if the culture of how we work with all this stuff is changing? Take another other example and some personal learnings. Uh, this is a case uh, for Lata Pista, it's about selling bathrooms. And uh, basically the brief was that, how can we make pay people to buy bathrooms instead of just buying a few components. And uh, it could have easily been an interior design project because it's starting from like, how should we develop the shopping experience in the store to make people actually, instead of buying just a couple of components, to buy, make them buy a whole bathroom. But um, 
eventually it was also in in an interior design project, but it started from something totally different, and it started really from the why question. So uh, the bridge, bridge you can see on the top corner, sort of summarizes the thing here. Like most of the bathroom renovations, they are really painful, and you end up to the bottom there, and maybe some after some time you get up. But the basic vision here was that, yeah, we should build a bridge to people to cross that, you know, coil, what do you call it in English? I don't know, hole, <laughs> so something, yeah. So, but, but the thing was, like, people come to the shop too late. They already, they already on their way down there. So how can you build the, the bridge from there? You should change many things. You should change also how you how you communicate about what you're offering. Then, what's really important, like change the way of the model, how the salespeople are working with customers, how they are using the places, the environment, the interiors, in a way that it sort of makes them a better salesperson. It's sort of like uh, the interiors are co-pilot here, and we did lots of. Uh, Lots of, you know, working, with, like understanding the customers, coming up with different ideas, different tools, trying them out in a real world. But my personal learning was that we did it much too late. We should have started like a lot earlier. Because now when I look back to this project, even though you, in a way, these results are really astonishing. Like sales went up and less time with customer. So it's like win-win to the company, but it was it wasn't easy, you know. Uh, when we started with the worst, first really rough trials in our pilot destinations, people were really against. Like salespersons were really against those that we don't feel that this helps. We hate this. It looks bad, and you know we realized that without them feeling that it's going to help them it's not going to succeed. So we really need to, you know, find those tools that actually help the people. And that's, that's my learning, like, you know, really identify the right problems and then it's much easier to come up with right solutions. Because good ideas, they usually just don't work. Sometimes that's really frustrating. Almost always in the project stores I feel like, yeah, yeah, I got these good ideas, like, and which services, most of them just don't work either because of the customers and when it's about changing behavior you can't really see that yeah you can't really say that my idea is so good that it will more certainly change the behavior because you know changing behavior is really complicated and kind of services that i work a lot with it's also always also about like changing the behavior on the other side of the table so the customer service people, the sales people, how to create an environment where they self get motivated to change and find that, yeah, this is really helping me to be a better salesperson. When you hear something like that, that then you know that now I got a, now I got a right problem and, and hopefully quite good idea about. Uh, so uh, we should, in a way, we should dare to use service design, even tools and methods and processes, even more to design stuff that is incomplete. So uh, we are, like we as designers, we too often we think that we, we need to design something complete and which services doesn't just work. You have to be able to design stuff that is incomplete. And you have to be able to make more mistakes. And I guess you all heard this, like, you know, make a hundred prototypes and fail early to succeed sooner and so on and so on. But still, whenever you start making a prototype, you always want to succeed. You don't do it to fail, but maybe we should. Maybe we should be stupid to learn more. That's sort of an, yeah, well, well, well think about it. And um, it's probably, you know, it's familiar thinking from startups and especially lean startup and that kind of thinking but for big organizations is something that it's just doesn't fit to their culture and that what we that is what we are with each project that we are doing we are trying to help organizations to realize that they really need to change their culture of developing stuff this is my recent interpretation of of like you know a good service design projects but actually since 
five, six years, it has been a di totally different picture each year. So it's bound to change. And I guess it's also part of this l failing and learning thing. But now I feel like used to be like this. And let's start from the, you know, research and ideation and opportunity mapping and concept creation. And then you do your concept testing and implementing and have this nice structured process that engineers love. Now I feel like, yeah, let's just, let's just start doing stuff and we learn while we go. We experiment, we fail, we learn. But it's really important that we learn. And you can't really learn if you don't involve customers. With services, that's the only way of learning. And uh, then when you go around this circle, in the end you realize that this is the right problem. Or at least you feel that now this might be the right problem. And then you come start to see the right solutions also. But um, as for the involving, I really think that with services, there shouldn't be any other form of design instead of co-design. So it's sort of stupid to even talk about co-design because all design should be only co-design. And yeah, that's with each project that I do, I try to you know, more and more think that how can I involve people more in, or, in order to learn, learn faster and learn more. So otherwise, if you don't involve, you, it's hard to learn. And uh, recently I've been thinking a lot about this, that too much service design or any design is done on backstage. It's like done behind the curtains, in the meeting rooms, with your post-it notes, with your pen and paper, with your whatever tool you are using in your workshops. It should be done in, a, in the front stage with the customer. Then you really can see and understand whether you are actually changing the behavior or not. Then you can realize, you know, when the money changes the owner, that's the ultimate test. Then you know that your concept is actually working. Before that, it's just, uh, you want to ask? Yeah, but in a way, that's the thing that you, because otherwise I feel it's really hard to do good service design. It's a lot of guessing and projecting, predicting instead of like being able to do it. I think it shouldn't be that way. Let's talk after this presentation. If you can give an example and I can try to, to, to give more ideas about that. For, but for example here, a couple of retail cases. The other one is here, uh, what they are doing in City Market in Lahti. They have two performance indicators with this willingness to recommend and, and the average purchase. That's the only two main things that they measure. And then they have here all the ideas. They sit down every week with the whole team uh, of salespeople. They have the stuff that it's on trial now. They go the stuff through and they go through that whether does this work? Uh, how can we make it better if it doesn't work? Why it doesn't work and so on? Should we continue trial or not? What did we learn? And then there's stuff that it's, uh, it's been successful. And it's small things, but you know, together they, they, they make these indicators move. And that's really like learning. That's like, I'm not there saying as a, you know, great designer that do this and this and this. It's people doing design and just fascinating it with tools that help them to be more self-directed. And the uh, other one of really good example of getting to the front stage was that we did recently a project with Ruohon Juuri uh, trying to think about like what is their shopping experience in the future and how can we make people buy more and visit the shop more often. And they were really nice. They were really nice to give us one shop for one month. And they said, do whatever you want. You don't really get customers like that very often, really. Because they don't dare to do it, because they feel like they are afraid of their brand, you know, getting spoiled or whatever. But like that's the way I, I feel like if you do it that way, you can succeed much, much faster. And that's actually like a picture of one of my ideas that was on a paper, it was a really good idea. And when we talk with the customers, it was a really good idea. But in the end, I guess only one of these packs were both. 
So even though people say that, yeah, yeah, it's a great idea to put all the ingredients in the same pack and give a recipe and whatever, but in a real life context, in a real situation, people didn't buy it. And that was really one of the biggest learnings here, like concerning this idea, because then we had other variations and some of them worked better. But like this one favorite idea of mine, it didn't work at all, even though it should have, like based on this concept testing and customer insight. Or it also mean, might be that I'm just a bad designer, you never know. <laughs> but you know, the live environment is actually the real test. And uh, tool for learning is measuring with services. Because if you are trying to change behavior of people, uh, you, if you don't measure, you're just blindfolded. How can you know your ideas? Like what in them is good? And like where are the reasons why things work and why they don't work? You have to measure. You have to measure from different levels to understand the causalities, what affects what and how. Like measuring is like the eye for the designer to understand like how how is my service going to change. If you think about the airport security sec, it's for example, it's a very structured service. Customers have to go through a certain procedure and so on. But even there, if you don't measure what affects what, you're just blindfolded. You are just doing stuff and I'm now sometimes I wonder like there's so many design agencies that's just guessing and doing stuff and predicting and thinking their ideas are good and it, when when it doesn't work they blame somebody else they blame the customer or the, they blame the client or or somebody who was involved there so this is another big learning from my career and I couldn't agree more from this comment from colleague. It's actually, you know, the idea part in a way. Or sometimes even finding the right problems. It's sometimes when you, when you get better and better, it's it's not that hard. What's really hard is to make change happen. And uh, with service design there's really there's a lot lot of talk without actually making the change happen. It's a lot about you know, we are so enthusiastic about our tools and processes that we, we sort of forget that whether this actually is, helps anyone is based on if we actually make the change happen. So making, getting companies to adapt, that's the hard thing. And uh, something that you actually get really frustrated about when you have, you know, this is from the cleaning services. We came up with lots of good concept ideas that we really believed in, that yeah, this is good stuff, this is what should we do. But then you have this old organization, this big truck here, which is already full of boxes. And you know, that there's the old culture, and in order to put even one box in this truck, it might take two years. You have to get a lot of other boxes out and reorganize them, and that's really painful and expensive and so on. You can't really know whether your idea really work, works in the live, in live environment because it's still here, it's not on the you know, front stage. So we, we came up with sort of learning from this lean development and so on. We came up with the idea that, yeah, let's forget this truck for a while. Let's build a you know, faster, smaller car that we can put some of these boxes in and you know, drive around and test our ideas and see whether it's actually good, whether it's something that it's, you know, worth of trying to implement in a big truck. So we came up with this, like you have your pop-up shops and cafes and, you know, we came up with the, like, sort of a startup within, within a company, like pop-up unit of cleaning, who has a right to create its own culture, right to do things differently. Still it has like a backup and support from the big truck, but it really doesn't have to follow the same roads as the big truck does. And that's really like, I'm really enthusiastic about this kind of stuff because then you are really able to see whether you are making a change with your design and your, 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 the value promise that you are offering to clients. 
So, in a way, it's sort of like, it's really basic stuff. Going back to pages, basics, like how, when we start companies, like how we learn from the customer and see whether our business model works or not. And most of the organizations that I work with, they are those big trucks. And then you, if, if you want to make change happen, you have to come up all the time with ideas about how can we actually try and fail and learn and create an environment where that's possible. And I, I, uh, I've been organizing these service jam events from the beginning. It's it, like, like I, I can tell you in a bit, but like, like you see here, we just started. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure lots of stuff will work, but uh, on the other hand, like, I'm also really looking forward to what's gonna fail because that's really, in a way, it's just like lots of ideas, but you know, the process will start now. Now or not? First reaction. At least like when we have this kickoff meeting with the, the people who are part of this unit, they were like, oh really shit, are we, able to, are we actually able to stop doing this stuff that we think is stupid, that doesn't help the customer? Because they felt like we are doing lots of things that we just need to do because this organization has this procedure and so on. So it's like, really, can we concentrate on these things that we feel that this will actually make the customer happy? And that's like, I felt like, yeah, right. This is the way, like you, you know the best. You're there on the field, you should design, not me. And I, I'm looking forward, I, I can't really say. I also hope that we will fail a lot. And somebody asked like, what happens if we fail? Have you thought about if we fail? And I said, yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure we will fail, but that's also part of the thing. But you know, failing is hard because people always expect that, yeah, you should succeed immediately. Now they're part of this and you should succeed. Everybody waits for you to succeed and so on. This is what I love about this uh, service jam events code from the organizers, it's all about like 48 hours doing, not talking, trying stuff. And my interpretation of it is experimenting, not guessing, because so much service design is just guessing. And uh, actually, can even say that, you know, uh, no service concept survives its first contact with people. And it's always about, you know, people, those cleaners in this POP ISS unit. It's like whether ideas, mine or them, whether they survive the first contact with those people, that's the first ultimate test and that's where the design actually starts. This is a talk from the CEO of IDEO, Tim Brown, which I think really summarizes the, what I'm talking about here is that, you know, the model of design has changed and service design is just one evidence of that. We used to do this, you know, customer centric design, you know, designing for people, understanding, trying to understand what they want and so on. Then we started doing co-creation, you know, designing with people together. And now what we are starting to do more and more is actually designing by people. So in a way, you know, just facilitating the process where we are enabling behavioral change, uh, which is self-directed. Self so we are creating a setting where people themselves can sort of realize that this is where we want to go and they themselves then get motivated and we create tools that support that change. And it's quite different than, you know, being a designer in your silo thinking about certain touch point and how to make it look and feel good. It's something totally different. It's totally different skill set too. So hope they teach this stuff here in Alto, for example. But uh, in the end, like, this is still the hardest part, you know, because automatically we want to succeed. And I find it difficult every day. I, every failing hurts a bit. And, and the, the pain that comes from the failure sometimes blinds you from not seeing the learnings. And in a way, like, it's, it's failure contains the next solution towards the right problem but you only need to be there to look for it and that's the thing like that's that's hard but that's what we should 
do. And my prediction, in a way, is that where service design will go next, we will do failing on purpose in the future. We have to do it. It's hard, but we have to learn to do it on purpose. We have to learn to be more stupid in the first place. And then, when we fail, then we have to be clever to learn from it. All right. I got like uh, about five minutes now. I'm sorry, I, I need to rush to Tallinn to talk local government people there about service design and my boat is going to leave in about 45 minutes. So I don't want to fail in that one. But a couple of questions is all right. Can you please repeat the question because we don't have the catch What's that? Could you repeat them at least last Could you repeat the question? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so the question was that how do you convince the management to do this kind of stuff and, and work with people? Yeah. Uh, you know, with talking like this, for example, with case examples, of course, you know, showing the good results, showing the fast process, showing that this is the better way to make a difference. And luckily, those companies who come to us, they are quite often in, in really bad situation in a way that they, they, they are in a situation that they need to do something fast and they pretty much have already tried you know they have been doing this development in their silos for a long time so so they know that we need something radical different kind of thinking now it's not easy and usually first project you have to convince you have to do something small that show that with this kind of thinking you can get good results faster and then then you have the mandate to do more it's not easy but yeah yeah uh, so the question was that uh, examples about how we measure the end results yeah so uh, there was this picture quite often, like most of the stuff that I do there in the brief, there's always some kind of financial target, almost always. It might be the average purchase, it might be the, you know, changing the purchasing purchase behavior in a certain direction. So there's always the money indicator. But then added to that, we also always try to find the soft indicators, which might be like, you know, how satisfied the employers e are about their job because that's usually has a great effect on on the service that they provide to customers or if it's about customer experience we try to find those indicators uh, that really tell that we have now have the right you know uh, right things happening and for example willingness to recommend is one really good uh, KPE uh, which uh, tells that if, if we raise the willingness to recommend, it quite often has a, you know, uh, effect on how, how much people purchase and so on. Yeah, yeah that's what why we. So the question was that whether we 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 do projects that it, the pricing is like fee based or there's a common risk in a way and we would love to do it much more and we almost always we make an you know what do you call proposal that we we should do it this way that there's this stick and carrot in a way because <laughs> that that really gives you the motivation you kind of like because doing this kind of stuff it really needs an entrepreneurial kind of thinking it's the only way to do it and we would love to do it more and and at the moment for example we have a couple of projects and on, ongoing you know things happening with certain clients where that it's mostly clients that we have worked already a lot together with that then we have this bonus and stick thing going on okay maybe one more and then I rush to taxi
Uh, yeah, really good question. Uh, so how did we change the mental model of laptop is the salesperson? Actually, they were really against our rough ideas because they, they are really visual people. They felt like, yeah, we want to really make stuff that looks good, but you know, making stuff that look good, looks good costs money more, and you know, you don't really know whether the ideas, the tools, and all the interiors and stuff, whether it will actually work or not. So we wanted to make it, you know, cheap to try stuff out, and uh, lots of, you know, presenting the, you know, the customer-centric thinking and the new sales process by us, and of course by, by for example, their sales director went on but you know what really was the key when one of the salesperson that maybe was most against all of this stuff when she realized that actually actually this makes me sell more and she felt like yeah this how this is how it helps me and then she came you know the the, the person who told took it forward to other other people I really need to go because my taxi is calling, but you know, catch me online to ask more. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Reima. Grab your computer and run. <laughs> but hey, uh, before you go, uh, a few small announcements. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for showing up. We really appreciate that you took some time from your Christmas shopping and everything like that. Uh, the Startup Sauna has sent out an electronic questionnaire to everybody who is registered. So please help us understand where we have failed and help us understand what we can learn by filling out that questionnaire. We would really appreciate your feedback. And then also I, I tried to ask my daughter for a red Tontulaki this morning, but unfortunately she couldn't find a Tontulaki for me. I still want to be a little bit like Christmas Tontu. So for those of you who didn't come last when last time and didn't get a chance to pick up this Finnish design thinking book, then feel free to get your free copy of, of the Finnish design thinking book that, that was created now for the Slush Conference. So thank you very much and uh, hope to see you in the spring. We don't have a program for spring yet, but if you follow us on Facebook, then you will be the first to know when we have something to announce for the spring. Thank you.